Our next speaker is another student from psychology. Um, Aaron Wilson is a psychology major with K6, K6 licensure. Um, she is a member of Psychi, Alpha Lambda Delta. She's a student advisor, a teaching fellow, and an MCAN scholar. She is local, she's from Cary. Um, in her spare time, she works one-on-one -on -one with a chi child with autism. Um, her goal is to attend graduate school and become a um, special education teacher. Um, and we certainly need more good teachers. Erin, please join us and we'll welcome her. All right, so today there was 100 tickets available in this room and it was a sold out show. There is a 1,980 students enrolled at Meredith College. There's 33,144 students enrolled down the street at NC State. North Carolina has a little bit more than nine, nine and a half million people in it. The population of the United States is a little more than 315 million people. And the world population is at a staggering seven billion people, which has not only raised eyebrows, but it has also raised concern. The basics of humans by Maslow's law, hierarchy of needs, is we need food, water, and shelter, and company. And in this case, company means sex and companionship. However, population is increasing, and including the United States has already become more than two children per woman, and the highest fertility rate is in Niger with seven children per woman. But as this is increasing, food, water, and space are becoming limited and becoming really worrisome. Already in the world, more than 1 billion people lack clean water, and more than 2.5 billion people live without adequate sanitation. So, we know that sex leads to population. And in North Carolina, in 2010, the teen pregnancy rate was 49.7 in 1,000, with 27% repeat pregnancy. Onslow County had the highest amount highest percentage with 86.6 getting pregnant in a thousand and in comparison locally Wake County had a rate of 35.1 in a thousand. Still North Carolina's teen pregnancy rate is higher than the national average of 34.2 in a thousand. But with pregnancy and teen pregnancy we look at sex education and sex education is a money-making thing and if we spend a lot of money on it George W. Bush is, uh, funded the abstinence-only idea. In the beginning of his term, we spent $80 million, but and by the end, we spent $137 million. Obama then, in comparison, started this uh, comprehensive sex education idea, and in 2009, it was funded for $110 million. And last year, he requested $133.7 million, but it was only granted $105 million by the House of Representatives. Here's the formal definition of comprehensive sex education. I like to call this the contraceptives and um, all about sex approach. This tends to be accepted by the parent community, including in California, they did a study and 89.7% of the parents approved it. Here's the formal definition for abstinence only sex education. This is what I like to call the don't do it approach. Um, and this is what is commonly used in North Carolina and throughout the South. There is a significant increase of this kind of approach between 1995 and 2002. However, we like to think a lot of this is the age of technology and things and social media. So are we becoming educated from what we see and what we hear? And the answer really is no. There was a study that was done in 2011 by Jones and Vidalcom that found out although most teens have access to internet and high speed, they're not educating themselves adequately, and also they're feeling more pressured to have sex than to not have sex or become more educated. So, what influences sex and sexual behaviors? In background studies, you find 
a whole lot of things, including abstinence-only people will say, oh, this will delay sexual behaviors and you'll become more safe. And comprehensive sex studies will say, no, 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 no. Say, uh, comprehensive sex education will delay sexual behaviors and you'll be more safe doing it. So in my study this last fall, I did research on this exact topic, and I had a survey and used 120 Meredith College students, and predominantly my sample was Caucasian, or Caucasian, Southern, and Christian. I received a lot of nominative data at the end of it because I found that Meredith College students really didn't find um, school sex ed to be influential. More than half said it wasn't influential or it was only kind of influential. So one girl said, from the knowledge I gained myself, from the internet and hearing about it from my friends and my, from a small extent, my parents, I understood that sex was a serious matter and I take it seriously. Since I received little to no education on the matter from my school because they weren't allowed to teach anything but abstinence, only sex ed, I had to take matters into my own hands. So this girl was the small population of this class. This other girl, and scary stories from school really influence her sex education. <laughs> Another girl reported, at first, peer pressure from a boyfriend, and commonly I heard from, you know, their partner, most influenced my sexual behavior. But now morals and desire most strongly influence my behavior. However, commonly I got short responses, such as fears, a parent self, in the media and society. The last I heard was parents always being open and honest as well as a religious background. Being a Christian, especially a Catholic Christian, it's in, so important to save yourself for your future husband, which I'm proud to say that I have. I heard a lot of influence towards sexual behavior being connected to religion. So what does this mean? We spend money on it, we worried about population, but a lot of the research doesn't have answers. So does this mean we need to reform our sex education to be more influential and more effective because it's showing in studies that it's not? Or do we need to reform us as a society to be able to inform parents on how to better reach their children? 